That was great. I'd like to take him home with me to North Jackson. We need a song leader desperately. What great song leaders you have here. And everyone who has participated in the services um, have been just tremendous. I appreciate the prayers today so very much. I appreciate your being here this evening. I want us to study together from Ephesians chapter 2. If you want to go there with me, Ephesians 2, and we'll start momentarily at verse 8. Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 8. While you're turning there, let me express my gratitude to everyone who prepared the meal tonight, especially to whoever made the uh, banana pudding. Uh, that's my favorite, and uh, that was good. I mean, really good. Uh, too good, um, as a matter of fact, uh, because I ate way yonder too much of it. But everything was great. I mean, just tremendous. And it's a shame that we couldn't have had that meal after this service. I know that would have been really late to eat, but uh, I would have felt a lot more <laughs> comfortable. I can tell you that. And I would have eaten so much more. I've never seen so much food in all my life. It's like you were going to feed another congregation or two. I've never seen that much food before in a fellowship meal. So thank you so very much for having us and making us feel so much at home here in Jacksonville. Paul wrote, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Can God really forgive me? Just how far, really, can God's grace reach? Let's talk about it. One of the things that I really enjoy doing, I don't get the opportunity to do it that much, but I love to get up early in the morning and walk along the beach and pick up seashells. Or maybe late in the evening as the sun is setting, walk along the beach and collect seashells. And I can't tell you how many mornings I've, I've walked along the beach and watched the sun come up, fished a little bit, but mostly collecting seashells, or watched the sun set collecting seashells. Now, you know you can't be out there any other time because it's just downright embarrassing. You know, it used to be that people dressed like old Mother Hubbard. Now they dress more like her cupboard, bear. So it's just a little embarrassing so you get out there early in the morning or late in the evening with the other old people and you walk along the beach and you collect seashells. But I, I can't tell you how many times I've done that and, and thought about God and prayed and thanked Him for His wonderful creation. You know, when you're looking for seashells, you're looking for that perfect shell, that one-of-a-kind shell, that beautiful shell, the one that you want to add to your collection but inevitably, as you're walking along and you're collecting seashells, you find those that are broken, that are cracked, that are marred, that are stained, that aren't any good. And you just simply discard them over your shoulder or just throw them back out into the water. And I've walked along in the morning watching the sun rise or in the evening and watching it set and thought to myself, suppose God collected followers like we collect seashells. Suppose there was no room in his kingdom for those of us who are broken and flawed and stained. The good news is he does have room for us, each of us in his collection of followers. One of my favorite songs to sing is Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Every time I, I sing that hymn, I think that hymn was written about me. Because I think about my past. And I think about how God could forgive me. How, how could he do that? And forgive me completely. And then I think about my present struggles. And it's amazing to me, truly amazing to me, that God could find a place for me. I mean me in his kingdom, and in his work. So I do stand amazed that his grace can reach even me, and it can reach you too. But it seems like today we're a little confused about the subject of grace. 
it seems like there's a pendulum that swings to one extreme or the other. On the one hand, you have people who only want to talk about grace and faith. And you don't hear really anything much about the importance of obedience. But it'll swing to the other side and you'll hear a lot about faith and obedience, but you'll never really hear anything about grace. Now, I grew up in a congregation like that. I heard very few lessons on grace or mercy or God's love. Both extremes are inadequate and both extremes are scripturally wrong. We need balance. And Paul gives us that balance in this wonderful passage. One way to illustrate it is a story told about Andrew Carnegie. He was a great American entrepreneur and he traveled throughout this land and he gave seminars about how to have a successful business. And at the end of each of his um, speeches, he would have a Q&A, question and answers. And on one occasion, he was having a Q&A and this young man that was in the audience raised his hand and Ask him, Mr. Carnegie, can you tell me which is the most important part of a successful business? Is it labor, capital, or industry? And Carnegie smiled and said, okay, I'll answer your question with a question. Can you tell me which is the most important leg in a three-legged stool? In other words, you need all three. And in salvation, if you'll allow me the analogy this evening, we need all three. Grace, faith, and obedience. And so as we think about this passage that Paul penned so long ago, I want us to look at each of these legs and the first one's there for us, grace. And this is where Paul starts. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And so he says that in verse eight, but he had said it parenthetically in verse five. So he has grace on his mind. And if you read that entire second chapter of Ephesians particularly the first 12 verses, you're impressed by the love of God, by the grace and mercy of God. And so that's where we begin. That's the most important part. That's where we start. Grace has been defined in a number of different ways by people. Unmerited favor, receiving something that you didn't deserve. You were speeding. You got pulled over. And instead of receiving a ticket, he just gave you a warning. That's grace. I heard one preacher describe it like this. He took the word grace and He made an acrostic and he said, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Now, I can I can see that I can get that picture when I think of grace and, and, and I think of all those different descriptions. But tonight, will you think of grace with me as God taking the initiative, God making the first move? And God offering us this wonderful gift called salvation, the forgiveness of sins. Now, there are other passages in the Bible where this is brought out, like Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the gift is that gift of salvation and grace by its very definition is a gift. But it is God who's the giver. And so God is offering us this tremendous gift. So we think about grace as God making the first move. Really, everything about life that's good and right and perfect is because of a gracious God. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Translation, God is good and God only gives and always gives good gifts. So when you think about grace, think about it in terms like this. The very air that we breathe today is because of a gracious God, a benevolent God, a God who loves us. The food that we enjoyed, the water that we drank, every good and perfect gift comes from God. And the precious hands and tender hearts that prepared those dishes, they too are representative of a good God that loves us and cares about us, and wants to save us. So really, everything that's good and right and perfect about our lives, a blessing in our lives, is because of the grace of God. Now, I didn't ask God for any of that, did you? I didn't I didn't wake up this morning and ask God for air to breathe, or water to drink, or food to eat. It's just always there. 
We don't really know how to explain it. We just realize that when we're thirsty and we need water, we just go get water. It's always there. I wonder if you woke up one morning and it wasn't there. God's grace is what produces these gifts that we so enjoy. And there will come a day when there will be no more water, when God will be done with this earth and he'll do away with this earth. But right now, as we live and breathe and work and play, we have God to thank for that. That's grace. God making that that move, that initiative, making that possible for us because we are his creation, his greatest creation. We are his people. He loves us. We're his children. He's our father. And he blesses us with good gifts every single day. And at the top of the list is salvation. I didn't ask Jesus to come and die for me. Did you? I wasn't there the day that he died on the cross. But I know this. God sent him into the world to save me. And Jesus died on that cross and shed that blood to save me. Why? I do not know. Except by the grace of God. One of the verses that we love and and I love so very much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. So God's purpose is not to break us. God's purpose is to make us. And yes, he does love us just the way we are. And he'll accept us just the way we are. But he will not leave us just the way we are because he wants us to be like his son. He wants to mold us and shape us into the image of his son. And that's the best life that any person could ever live in this world. All of that's made possible by his grace. I know when we look at John 3, 16... Really, the key word to us is the word love. And that's a, that's a big word. God is love. 1 John 4, 8. But underscore another word, another four-letter word in that verse. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. That's grace. He did that. He didn't have to do that. He chose to do that. He chose to save the very ones who crucified his son. That's grace. We know Romans 3.23 pretty well, don't we? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I grew up hearing that all of my life. Do you know what verse 24 says? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We don't quote verse 24. We stop at 23. And we hammer each other with the fact that we're sinners. Yes, we are. But almost in the same breath, Paul hastens to say, by God's grace, we're saved. But it isn't cheap grace. It cost God His only begotten Son. If it cost God that much, then why should we be upset if it ought to cost us, in comparison, very little, but something. He gave, and because He gave, we give. So grace, in our three-legged stool, think about it as God taking the initiative, making the first move. I didn't make the first move. You didn't make the first move. God made the first move. Think of grace like that. Now, number two, think about the leg of faith. Because that's in the text. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we are saved by faith. And grace in combination with one another. But if grace is God taking the initiative and making the first move, then faith becomes my move. It becomes my acceptance of his gift. It becomes then my part in the plan of salvation. You can think of it like this. God has a part that he played and we have a part we must play. And a part of that is faith. And here's why faith is so important. In John 8, 24, Jesus looked at the Pharisees, his own people. He came to his own people and his own people rejected him. John 1, 11. So here's a classic example of that. 
But Jesus says in John 8, verse 24, except you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. So when you think about it, if I don't ask God to forgive me through Christ for my sins, then I still bear my sins. I still carry my sins with me. But through the grace of God, through the blood of Christ, trusting and obeying, I find the grace sufficient To cleanse even my sins. To forgive even me. But Jesus laid it on the line when he said. Except you believe that I am he. You will die in your sins. And Hebrews 11.6. And Hebrews is that great chapter of faith isn't it. And the writer says at the very outset of that chapter. But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God. Must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if God's. Grace is God coming to me, then faith is my going to God, hastening to God. And I need to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And one of his greatest blessings is the blessing of forgiveness. I don't know any other way to illustrate it better than this story that Jesus told so long ago. We pick it up in Luke 15. Excuse me. Luke 15, verse 17, in what we know as the parable of the prodigal son. This is the turning point of the story, of course. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said unto his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and bring him to the fatted calf and kill him and let us be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost. And is found. Here's a father who forgave his son. And his son made it very clear. I have sinned against you. His father loved him and forgave him. And even though the son said, I don't deserve to be your son anymore. I'll take a role as a servant in your household or in your service as a slave. And the father said, no, I will restore you and reconcile you to me. He loved him. Does any of that happen if that boy doesn't decide to go home? None of that happens. Erase that from the whole story. And that's the best crux of the story. That's the best part of the story. But erase all of that if that boy doesn't say, you know what? My father's a good man. And my father treats his servants and his slaves better than I've been treated in a far off country. I'm going to go home because at least I'll find a good man in my father. And he sinned against him. He broke his heart. Here's a father who says, I thought you were dead. I would never see you in this life again. But beyond that, worse than that, I thought I would never see you in heaven again. It's a parent's worst nightmare. That their child is lost eternally. And you'll never be with them for eternity. And so here's a father who's been broken hearted. But he forgives him. He restores him. He gives him back everything he had traded away, sold away or lost. He loved him. None of that happens. If that boy doesn't believe in his father. Get up out of the pig's pen. And go home. So grace. Faith. But Paul includes our third leg of our three-legged stool, obedience. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, we love to quote eight and nine, but we don't tag along with ten. And the Bible is a whole. You can't just pick and choose what you like and leave the rest out. Faith Grace, or grace, faith, and obedience, all three are necessary. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. There were Jews in Paul's audience 
who believe that they can merit salvation because they could keep the law. But their struggle or the dilemma, if they were honest with themselves, they couldn't keep the law perfectly. And so therefore they could not save themselves. So you cannot be saved by meritorious works of the law. But does that rule out all works? No. Paul said, we not only need to be doing good works, we should be zealously doing good works. So there are some works that Paul says won't help. Meritorious works can't do it. But works of grace are works because of grace and faith. Yes, and are necessary. Who among us tonight could stand up and say, I have no sins in my life. I've not sinned. I've done everything I was supposed to do. And listen, I haven't left anything undone either. I mean, I've been, do I dare say it? Perfect. Who would stand up and do that? No one here tonight. No one. Even the best of people here tonight would not stand up and boast that because no man can boast that. But there would be people perhaps who think that way because they just in their minds just cannot conceive that it was ever their fault. So there are works that we cannot count on, but there are works we must be engaged in or be lost. It's a three-legged stool, grace, faith, and obedience. Let me show you some other places. For example, in James 2, 24 and 26, twice, faith without works is dead being alone. So when you find faith alone in the Bible, the only place you find it is in a negative vein. That is, faith alone cannot save you. And faith apart from works or obedience is dead faith. Another way to say it is Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Will you note this? That the grace of God has appeared to everyone. That is, the grace of God is made available to everyone. But not everyone will accept it. And not everyone wants to be saved. Some people don't want to be saved. Some people don't want to be forgiven. Some people don't want to be bothered with this message. But notice that Paul says, there is a life that you deny. And there is a life that you embrace. I thought we were saved by grace. We are. God made salvation possible. But in accepting it, we trust him and obey him. Another way of saying it is in Titus 3 verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done have we been saved. But by his mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So not by any works of mine or meriting it at all. It is by his mercy that any of us are saved or forgiven. Yet it is through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. What could the washing of regeneration be other than baptism? And what could the renewing of the spirit be other than what we find in the scriptures? Let me show you another way it said. In John 3, verse 5, you remember Nicodemus who came to Jesus at night and he had thoughts about the kingdom apparently on his heart. But Jesus, remember, said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Grace, faith, and obedience. It is a three-legged stool. You knock one of those legs out and the stool collapses. You take one of those steps in God's plan of salvation and salvation collapses. It's a three-legged stool. My Bible still says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. And so grace is God taking the first step and God saying, I know Who you are, I know what you've done, and I know your past, I know your weaknesses, but here, here is my son dying for you. Will you trust me, and will you obey me? 
and in blessing us, we know the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life. Let me see if I can illustrate it as we close with three illustrations from the Bible. The walls of Jericho. You may remember the story of the Israelites who marched around the city of Jericho and the walls then would fall. But maybe we don't remember this part of the story in Joshua 6 verse 2. Do you know what God said to Joshua before they ever started marching? I have put the city in your hands. In other words, you're going to win. I know you look at that wall city and there's no way we can defeat them. I'm telling you, before you ever set foot out of camp, you have won the battle. Now, that's grace. That's grace because you know the Israelites. You know where they've been 40 years earlier. They were almost at the identical same place. And they said, there's no way we can do this. Even though God said, I'll give you the land. They said, there's no way. They didn't trust him. They didn't obey him. And because they didn't, their joy was postponed for 40 years. They're right back there now 40 years later. And here's a new generation of people. And here's God saying to Joshua, the city is in your hands. That's grace. But Joshua had to trust the Lord. And Israel had to trust Joshua. And then the strategy, the military strategy was rather bizarre, wasn't it? The first six days they marched around the city only once. They said nothing. They did nothing. The seventh day they marched around it seven times. And after the seventh time on the seventh day, 13 times in seven days, they then shouted for the Lord and blew the ram's horns and those walls came tumbling down. And Hebrews 11.30 says they only fell after they had been encircled seven days. Those walls do not fall unless Israel marches the way the Lord said as many times as he said. And they did exactly what he told them to do. And no matter how strange that sounded to them, it worked. And the city fell. And it fell in a horrible way. I don't understand baptism. How it is that in that watery grave that he washes away my sins. I just know it. When you come up out of the waters of baptism, you're saved. You're forgiven. All your sins are washed away. And I don't understand how walking in the light as he is in the light can bring about the forgiveness of my sins when I confess those sins to him. I don't know how he does that. I just know that when he does it, it's wonderful. I don't know how he does it. And maybe it's not for me to understand all of it. Maybe it's for me to just trust him and obey him knowing that his grace has yet to ever fail us. So you have those walls. But you know there's a part of that city, a part of those walls that did not fall. And that was the house of Rahab. And Rahab was a harlot. She ran a brothel. But according to Hebrews 11:31, she hid the spies and then sent them out a different way. She was trusting what the spies had told her, that God was going to bring down the city. And Rahab said, well, spare me. And they said to her, all right, you stay in your house and you have a scarlet cord hanging out your window. Now, I want you to try to imagine when the whole city is falling now and their homes were built into their walls. The whole place is shaking all around you and it's about to fall. And then it does fall. How many times do you want to get out of that house and run for the hills? She stayed in her house. And so did her family. And when the smoke cleared, there was a single solitary scarlet cord still dangling from that window. And God had spared her. Do you know she's in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1 verse 5? She's one of five women in the genealogy of Jesus. One, she's a Gentile. She's not a Jew. But number two, she's a prostitute. Now, how do you get into the genealogy of Jesus with that checkered past? May I say by the same way any of us are forgiven tonight, by the grace of God. But she trusted God. She obeyed God. And by God's grace, she was saved. Rahab's very interesting, isn't she? She has a son by the name of Boaz. Boaz marries Ruth. They have a son by the name of Obed. Obed has a son by the name of Jesse. And Jesse has eight boys, the youngest of whom is David.
David. That's why Ruth's in the Bible. And that's why Rahab is in the genealogy of Jesus. But it's amazing, isn't it? That God could forgive her, heal her, and save her. And then finally, I know we know about the Old Testament, and there's so many others that we could use. Think with me about the Apostle Paul for just a few seconds. Paul will call himself the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1.15. Have you ever said that about yourself? I have. But then in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10, listen to what he says. For I am the least of the apostles, and I'm not meet or worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not given in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Now let me ask you something. If you were looking for a preacher, which you're not, but if you were looking for a preacher and you were taking resumes and Paul's resume came across your desk, would you hire him? Now, now see, you, you, 20, hindsight's 2020. You can't do that. You don't know anything about what you know now. You just see his resume come across your desk. Well, he's been in prison. You sure you want to hire him? He isn't married. He doesn't have any children. You sure you want to hire him? He's a murderer. He murdered a man. Sure you want to hire him? He never stayed anywhere much. He was moving all the time from church to church to church to church. Sure you want to hire him? A church hopper? Would you really hire Saul of Tarsus to be your preacher? We wouldn't, but God did. And that's all that matters. How in the world does someone like Saul of Tarsus become the Apostle Paul? The same way any of us become Christians, by the grace of God. And go to the last slide. I think sometimes we look at this and we say, can God's grace reach even me? Or how far will God's grace reach? Well, maybe another way to, to ask this is, how far will my faith take me? How far will I trust him? Maybe I've trusted him half the way, but will I go all the way? And actually be baptized for the remission of my sins? Actually become a member of the Lord's church? Take up his cross, bear it daily, and live for him? It's not how far will God's grace reach, it's how far will my feet take me? During World War I, during the worst time of that war, there was a man who deserted his post. He had had enough of it. He was going home. He was from Europe. He was going back. He had fought. He had done enough. He had seen his buddies die. He had seen so much death. He couldn't stand it. He couldn't take it anymore. He decided to desert his post. So he struck out, and he went out across the countryside, but a fog engulfed or enveloped where he was trying to travel and he couldn't make his way and so he's traveling literally in the dark and he's trying to find markers to he wanted to get to the coast get on a boat go home and never be heard from again but he couldn't find his way and so he bumped into a street sign and he thought here it is i i now can i've got a marker and i know where i'm going so he climbed up that that street sign and he struck a match, and when he did, he realized it wasn't a signpost. It was a crucifix. And when he lit that match, the face that was looking back at him was the face of Jesus Christ on the cross. Someone who never deserted his post and gave the last ounce of his blood for the cause for which he believed in with all of his life. The soldier shimmy back down. And the next morning found him in his usual spot in his foxhole. Ready to do his duty for his country. Have you looked in the eyes of Jesus lately? Those eyes were set for us. Maybe the hardest thing to do in life is to forgive yourself. Maybe the reason we're not doing as much as we'd like to do or ought to do, maybe Christianity for us is inactive, 
simply because we're paralleled, uh, paralyzed rather, by this inability to forgive ourselves. I read once where someone once said that all psychiatric hospitals would empty out in a matter of hours if people could only find a way to forgive themselves. I don't know what your sins are. I know what mine are. I don't know what your struggles are. I know what mine are. I'm the least perfect person in this room. My feet are made of clay. I promise you. And I struggle every day. There's not a day goes by that I don't struggle with temptation like anybody else. But I'm convinced of one thing. God loves us. And he's our father. And we are his children. And just like your children and my children, I will love them till the day I can't love them anymore. And they're not perfect and they'll make mistakes, but I'll never stop loving them. And they may leave me and run away from me and not speak to me and go away from me and never come back to me in this life. I'll never stop loving them. I'll love them till the day I die. That's God. We're his children. He loves us. And he's crying out through his son on the cross. I forgive you. I do. I forgive you. I know you don't believe that, but I do. And this is how much I love you. And you are forgiven. Trust me. Obey me. And know the life that the Christian lives. So can God forgive me? Really forgive me? Yes. Do you believe that? And if you do, will you obey the gospel? While together we stand and sing.